what I had in mind for this activity was to walk through um, a couple of the versions of the Bragg N and N um, that I spoke about in my presentation and show you just, you know, what is 11x difference look like? Uh, look at uh, the code, um, what you would need to do to uh, profile your code, um, walk through and examine uh, the profile of a couple of the versions of the code and uh, hopefully make it a interactive. We can explore uh, what you would want to explore. Feel free to ask questions. Um, so in the previous presentation, let me get the correct PowerPoint up here. We had uh, the Bragg in and in, which is neural network composed of uh, convolutional layers, a uh, non-local um, attention block, um, and some fully connected layers, all to produce from a um, selected portion of a larger image to identify the YZ coordinate of the peak in that clipped portion of the larger image. And so the idea um, with this activity is train this model to be able to recognize the center of the peaks. And this comes from um, uh, fast X-ray Bragg peak analysis uh, using deep learning. Um, this problem uh, comes from that paper. And it also uh, we worked with uh, Argonne uh, on this. So the GPU performance was around 800 seconds for 500 epochs, and that was a mini batch size of 512, and that's what we'll be running with um, in this exercise. And the goal is to re reduce the time to train to under two minutes and, and scale. So let me first just talk about the, the end results. And this is uh, typical of a lot of the models we get from customers, whereby there's a significant amount of non-neural network processing that has to take place in order to feed the neural network. And in this case, the aqua color is the processing on the host, and the salmon color is the processing on the accelerator. And as you can see, as you go from left to right, um, the amount of processing on the host decreases significantly, and the uh, amount of process or processing time on the accelerator does not increase even though we're moving computation from the CPU onto the accelerator. And so then the overall time shrinks and you have a faster time to solution. So let me go back. And let's first talk about the initial port. And basically the flow is you load the data from disk and you get a, a frame in memory. Then you do random clipping, and that's for data augmentation pro, uh, purposes for neural network training. And then uh, after that, you do some denoising and then normalization. And then you finally get the image that you're going to present to the neural network. Along with that, from the um, random clipping, as you clip a different gold box within this purple region, the center of the peak shifts by the opposite vector of the um, data augmentation shift. So you have to also give the neural network's loss function, you have to give it the updated um, YZ coordinate in order to tr properly train the model. So this is what was uh, ported out of the box and we'll run that and just do a comparison of what it looks like to run that version versus the, the end version and see what that, you know, have a feeling for how much that could affect your ability to um, iterate on your problem. So in that 
um, results slide, the uh, second two bars correspond to this stage here, where you move the image denoising up and you do it once at, at uh, program initialization or when you create your model object and its init function in PyTorch. Um, and also moving the image normalization from the host into the IPU. And this is, goes to you know, our claims that uh, our architecture is flexible enough to handle a wide ver variety of uh, computation types. And so you know, again, you get the image and the updated peak location that are presented to the neural network and the loss function. And then the final stage is to move the random clipping out of the host and onto the accelerator. Okay? So first let's just run 25 epochs of the final version. Now first it has to load a lot of the data into the server's memory and that takes about eight and a half seconds and then it's going to go through a compilation step. For graph core, we have to compile the graph into a static representation that is then loaded onto the accelerator. In this case, I've previously run it and it is cached that executable or that graph. And so what this is doing is just reading the cached version of it. And so now you can see it here doing the epochs and there we're done and it processed about 401,000 um, frames per second. So we'll remember that result and uh, I'll go into a different directory where I have the original ported version and we'll do the same thing. And we'll see that it runs a good bit slower and then while it runs we'll go off and look at some of the um, profiles that I've saved for these runs previously and we'll pull up what's called the graph analyzer which is just our GUI for looking at profiling data. So you can see this is running considerably slower. So let me pull up Actually, it's the one farthest over here. So this is the summary page that you would get from a profile that you can generate just by setting um, a, an environment variable in your run. And I actually can show you exactly how easy it is to include in your script to make that change. So let me go to the main here, actually it's the execute. And if we go down, no, it's main, sorry. This line right here right there in Python you can just add that uh, environment variable setting and that causes the runtime to use an instrument, instrumentated version of the graph and generate cycle, by, cycle accurate profiling information. It's dumped into a file. And by the way, you can also programmatically access the data that this GUI um, pulls up from Python although right now it's not, uh, the documentation is not uh, the best in the world something that I'm experimenting with myself. So some of the uh, capabilities um, that you have with this GUI and the data that's sort, stored off are you can see the number of compute sets which is right here and that is the number of sets of graph operations that can be operate that can be executed in parallel. So there's 404 groups of those. There's almost 3 million edges, which are tensor, uh, tensors that are passed between the graph operations. 
number of variables and the number of vertices. And a vertice is basically uh, a, sec a segment of code that we call a covid. So if you were programming our system in C++, what you would do is you would write a codelet in C++ and you would write a control uh, function that would instantiate the tensors that are the inputs and the outputs. And also, if you want, you can specify um, the spatial layout on the accelerator um, using uh, directives in the C++ or actually just function calls in the C++. So this is all well and good. Um, how about something a little more uh, graphical and interesting? This just shows the memory usage across all of the tiles. And you can see that we are well below the 624K of memory per tile. We're down at about 256K bytes um, per, across all of these different tiles. Now, one of the things to note is that um, the tile memory is managed um, almost like a, uh, it's not really a software cache, but it's a, like a scratch pad where we track the liveness of variables and overlap their um, residency in um, the local memory um, when there are cases where the residency doesn't overlap. So that saves a considerable amount of memory if the compiler can determine that. And that's what this liveness report is here. And you can see as the, the program steps progress, and a program step is you know, one of the executions of those groups of vertices that are, can be executed in parallel. Excuse me. And so you can see how this builds up we got a peak right here, and that is actually um, from a, let's just hold, I'll hold it right there. That's a, a three by three convolution. So you, it makes sense, the convolution is a, uh, an intensive operation, um, and that's where you can see peaks. Um, we have uh, a display of the program tree where you can uh, scan down through the hierarchy of operations and functions that are called as part of the graph execution. You can also search for um, operations. And then you can push in to get uh, more information about here's the actual library call that corresponds to that uh, operator. Um, let's see, you can get a summary of all the operations in the, in the graph, and you can sort them by, um, let's go descending. You can sort them by coat size and measured cycles. Mm -hmm. So this is all great, but the, the most in, interesting part is um, the execution trace. And you can see here these huge um, stream copy where they have a begin and a mid and an end. And that is uh, really poor data transfer from the host to the accelerator. And so that is something that um, the modifications are meant to attack, to pull the the begin phase is actually when the accelerator has requested from the host a tensor, an input tensor. And then the amount of time that it takes the host to actually respond with that tensor and start transferring data to the blade. The mid begins when the transfer to the blade starts and ends when all of the data has arrived at the blade. And then the end phase is the distribution of that data to all the tiles on, on the IPUs on the blade, okay? So the real interesting portion of this um, trace, you can zoom in either, whoops, you can zoom in either by uh, moving these bars here 
and you can move into um, the trace and you can then hover over an, an operation and get its cycles. You can punch in and get uh, information about the code size. But one thing, remember this model slash NLB. Well, if we look at the code, if we look at our model code, and we move up a little bit, we can see a class right here on line nine. I'm not very good at the Mac touchpad here, but that is the um, class or the layer that corresponds to that operation that you can see in the, in the trace. Okay, so let's just pop back on this one to 100% and we'll go back to that ugly picture of uh, wasted time. Then let me pull up another instance of the graph analyzer and this shows the ending profile and it looks somewhat ugly as well. But the thing to notice is it's 5.8 million total cycles for these two mini batch executions or two chunks of 512 uh, elements. So if we look back at our previous version, the, the initial version, it's 7.2, 7.3 million cycles. Now another thing we can do is you know punching back and forth between windows to try to compare is tedious so there's a capability of comparing side by side um, to uh, execution traces and you get uh, in red the diffs and you can also have side by side um, displays of the execution flame graph let's get rid of that So in the changes, we move the data augmentation process or function from the host to um, the accelerator. So it ought to show up in um, our execution trace. So this is the initial um, version. And I'm not very good at doing the touchpad to do the scan, the punch in, but here we'll do this way. Again, well, what I'm trying to show is this starts out with some convolutions, goes to the uh, NLB block in midway through and then goes through more convolutions and then the fully connected layers. But there, there's no data augmentation here because this was the initial version. If we pull up where to go? If we pull up the, the final version and we push into this or zoom in, You can see the augmentation um, was here, and you know it involves this uh, multi-slice gather, um, involves, um, well, it's called stage one. Exchange pre is an operation where to do the global exchange between um, the local memories, sometimes you have to uh, format or rearrange, like you know, say maybe transpose um, that data because it is more efficient to send the transpose version to its recipient for it to process, uh, you know, for further processing. So this augmentation took 43,517 cycles. Uh, this version of the machine is the, the Mark II um, and it runs at 1.3 gigahertz. Um, the machine that you guys will uh, get to replace your 
old, old Mark I uh, version of our machine. Um, we'll run at 1.85 uh, gigahertz, and, um, but it has the same uh, basic structure um, in terms of number of tiles and the um, latency of the exchange. So not to run through that too much. This is finished and it ran at basically 45,000 uh, frames per second. Whereas if we, rem if we remember, come on, here we go. If we remember from the first run that we did, we had roughly 401,000 frames per second. So it's, you know, it's there in order of a magnitude different in by just moving uh, pre-processing operations from the host to the accelerator. So with that, um, that's all I had in mind to show you. Um, if you have any questions or something you'd like me to show you, just let me know or um, ask me uh, after the session. Thank you for your time. Thank you.